All right, welcome, welcome everyone um, to Aria Rapids Transit Transit Talk. Um, this is a monthly webinar where we dive deep into issues surrounding public transportation in the Richmond, Virginia area. My name is Faith Walker. I'm the executive director of RV Rapid Transit. Now, as, as, no, we, as you know, and maybe some of you don't know, um, we are a nonprofit here in the Richmond region dedicated to advocating for frequent and far reaching public transportation. Uh, we do that in three ways. Number one, we want to see more buses go more places. So people um, <clears throat> having the ability to access jobs in different areas, not just in the city. Richmond limits, but also in surrounding counties. Um, and then secondly, we want to see people have dignified places to wait on the bus. So we're advocating for more shelters and benches and dignified places to wait on the bus. And then last but not least, least um, we advocate for decisions to be made um, right at the hands and accessibility for transit riders. So we value the writer's voice. So we wanna make sure that writers are part of the decision process when it comes to public transportation planning and decision-making. Um, so today, what I wanted to do is um, just go over some housekeeping. This is recorded. So we would ask that you would all please put your um, selves on mute, keep yourself on mute throughout the entire recording or event today. We will have an opportunity for you to have conversations and ask questions. So um, to make sure that all of our questions are asked, if you can put in the chat your question, but hashtag it Q or hashtag question so that I will know that it's a question and we'll make sure we answer it. Um, and then secondly, this is recording. So we'll have these recordings up on our YouTube page. All right, but before we get started, we always like to start off um, with some news. So I'm gonna turn it over to Richard Hankins, our programs and communications manager. Take it away, Richard. Hey guys, uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, as Faith said, my name's Richard. Um, and so just for some transit news, um, so first off, uh, parking minimums were eliminated in the city of Richmond. Uh, for those who don't know, in most cities in the United States, there's a mandated amount of parking per apartment, uh, per business, even sometimes per bowling alley. It gets really bizarre. And oftentimes it can raise rents, make places less walkable, and make them less conducive to transit. So we're really happy that there's been a big policy shift towards making cities prioritize people over car, and it will pay dividends for transit. Um, very exciting news. Yesterday uh, was the second day of the Virginia Transit Association's annual conference, and we actually won an award. We won the Lisa Guthrie and Linda McMullen Transit Advocacy Award. It was the inaugural award for this public transit advocacy, and they were so impressed by our work, um, by our continued advocacy and education towards making Richmond's transit a better place, always speaking up, building a coalition, the writer's voice, elevating all of those voices, and the Better Bus Stop program, getting community members involved to do what they can do to make the bus system better. Um, it was a huge honor. It was completely unexpected. Um, and so we're just really happy to be recognized for our work towards making Richmond a better place. Um, finally, um, if you guys know, either from a previous transit talker in general, uh, GRTC has this new infrastructure plan to drastically increase the number of uh, bus stops with benches or shelters. And so that is coming through. There was a new bus shelter installed at 25th and S Streets in Churchill. So we're really happy to see that. Back to you, Faith. All righty. So what I wanted to do at this portion, we always play um, a writer's voice comment. And this is our writer's voice program where our transit ambassadors um, go out to each bus stop and collect stories, impact stories of what it's like using public transportation uh, in the city of Richmond. This is a comment from Janasia. And um, let's listen to it because I, I love to hear young people's perspective when it comes to public transportation. So let's listen. Diana, can you just give me a thumbs up to make sure we can hear it when I play? Okay. My name is Janasia. I just think the bus routes like should be free also. Like don't go back to paying. Just be free because it's better free. Just in case your mom don't want to take you nowhere. You have a bus, a free bus to take and go places. 
But I be taking one A, one B, one C, thirty eight. I take every all the buses everywhere for real, just to get out the house more. So this is from a teenager who is using public transportation to develop more autonomy. Um, and even though her comments, hey, mom doesn't want to take me somewhere, this is giving young people access. Um, they have no barriers to just hop on a bus. And as many of you know, our young people through all, throughout COVID um, have been put in situations, been um, glued to video games, and this is allowing them to move about our city um, uninhibited. And some of the things of young people having access to autonomy with public transportation, it provides them a sense of self. So um, this is giving young people the ability to choose, hey, I don't have to sit at home. I can use the bus to get places. Um, but it also improves their confidence in traveling. Um, so young people have the ability to choose places, but also travel on their own. Um, also, I think um, command over their own minds. I mean, he has the uh, young people have the ability to think about places they want to go, hop on the bus, plan their trips, but also use critical thinking in planning their trips, um, but also increase responsibility. So one of the things that this can do for young people is give them the ability to choose to get employment, have a job, um, and then not have to depend on someone to get them there. So thank you so much, Janasia, for providing with that, um, that comment. And so um, I want to also hand it back to our speakers today. Today, you're all here because we wanted to, um, every year, um, last year was the first year that we launched the State of Transit Report, where we took um, the 2040 vision plan that was created by um, Plan RVA that really got the um, nine jurisdictions around us to all agree upon a master plan on what that should look like. Um, in transportation in 13 different corridors from Ashland to Petersburg and so forth. And so what we wanted to do was definitely um, take that where we are, where we wanted to be, where we are now and collaborate that with census data and, um, and information from GRTC. And we created the 2022 State of Transit Report last year and we have the a new report this year. I'm so excited to bring on our um, programs and communications manager, Richard Hankins, who led the charge on this report with the help of a research fellow by the name of Diana Hall. They're gonna be diving deep in this new report. And so without further ado, I wanna turn it over to them to take over the report. Take it away, guys. Awesome, yeah. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Richard again, I've already done that, um, but this this report has been a labor of love and um you know it took, took quite a few months to synthesize everything and you know while we were working on it you know there were policy changes happening during it um but so myself and uh, diana was a huge help getting some of the research the data points the storytelling trying to make a cohesive package and trying to make it accessible for people where it's not bogged down in technical jargon or just terminology that just makes your eyes glaze over it so without further ado, um, let's get started. Um, so as Faith mentioned at the very beginning, you know, it's good to start with our mission that like we're dedicated to educating, organizing and advocating for frequent and far reaching transit in the Richmond region. So part of that is, you know, I think we have a couple of mobility university students in here and that's just teaching them the history of transit, how to advocate um, and how that we can build a coalition to advocate and explain to people and positions of power why it's important to have transformational improvements in transit. Um, and so that that has three pillars. Um, we want more buses going more places. A lot of buses stop at the city line, which you will see in a few of our maps. And, you know, so we want people to be able to just do what they need to do to live a happy and prosperous life. And that involves, you know, transit lines that are frequent, that do not arbitrarily stop at borders when people's lives do not and all sorts of things like that. Secondly, uh, dignified places to wait. Um, as you guys, I'm sure, have seen, there are a lot of bus stops where it's just a stick in the mud. And so we are trying to advocate on multiple levels that people should at least be able to sit, but ideally should have a place to protect them from the elements. 
And our third pillar, elevating writers' voices. You know, it's one thing for us to say this as an organization, but we, we try to steep all of our advocacy um, in talking with the bus riders, hearing what they want. And that's why we're so happy to have our transit ambassadors, including Stephanie and Sarah, who are on this call, um, so that they can help give us the tools and the understanding and the messaging to effectively advocate for change. Um, Diana, do you want to talk about some of the benefits of transit? I'd love to. Um, so the four main benefits of transportation um, transit that we listed were accessible, financial, equitable, and environmental. Uh, accessibility wise, transit serves those who cannot drive. The access, is, access to vital transit is uh, good for the communities of ability. Viable public space can be dedicated to people instead of cars. Financially, it costs over $10,000 a year to own and operate a car, according to AAA. Uh, that comes to contact the context of how much the car costs, um, maintenance and repairs, gasoline, insurance for it. It just keeps adding up. Financially, uh, the greater Richmond area is currently zero fare to travel by bus. And every $10 million investment yields $32 million in increased business in transportation. Um, equitable, over 90% of those in public systems do not own a car. Public transit is particularly important to people with limited incomes, and over 50% of GRTC riders make under 25k a year. There are a lot of environmental benefits of public transit. Uh, for example, buses emit 80% less carbon monoxide than cars. Uh, switching to public transportation two days a week will cut personal greenhouse gas emissions by 25%. And public transit. Hello. You're good. <laughs> and we got you back. Reduces gasoline consumption by six billion gallons. Awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, and so here's the first of quite a few maps that we'll be showing as part of the report. Um, as some of y'all may know, uh, Richmond had the first electric streetcar system in the world. That's actually an official international engineering milestone. And we used to be on the forefront of transit, and I think it's safe to say we are not anymore. And on top of that, and part of the whole phrase of the automobile that happened in the early and mid 20th centuries, uh, people were ready to get rid of the streetcar, and it was burned to the ground in 1949. And, you know, we believe that Richmond should return to its roots with transformational improvements in public transit. And so this is what we're looking um, at. Uh, we wanted to show, okay, all the red lines are where we are today. And then um, you can also see um, all the streetcars as of 1930 that was um, gotten directly from the 1930 city directory and just you know in some ways some of the routes have replaced it but you know the streetcar had frequent service and obviously had better infrastructure since it was had fixed rail and electricity um so we just like to bring this uh, as historical context so people can think about where we were in addition to where we want to be so uh, the first of our pillars, uh, more buses, more places, we're going to look at our 2040 transit vision. And then, as some of y'all may know, there is a really bad bus operator shortage that thankfully is being addressed. And also, transit access to jobs or lack of access to jobs is another way to look at it. Um, and then the picture behind you, the 19 to West Broad, that is the short pump bus. So that is a really exciting regional route that goes right into our mission statement of um trying to get far reaching public transit. Um, and so we have a couple comments. We don't have the audio right now, um, but I wanted to read Donna's comment. Uh, Pamela talked about job access. Donna talked about access and frequency. We will have audio uploaded to our social media and then the text will be in the full report. But Donna's quote was honestly phenomenal. So she's saying, I don't understand why we can't go to Chesterfield. I don't understand an evening time when I'm trying to get home at six or seven. I got to wait 30 minutes for the next bus. Just don't make no sense. And she said it much better than I'm doing her justice for it. Um, but I think that's like six or seven isn't even that late. And then frequency is already declining. And then, you know, Chesterfield just has such a little bus service and they really just have one local route. And so, you know, try, it's one thing to look at the statistics and the map, but here the human impact from it is something we try, really try to push. And so um, this is a stylized kind of um, mass transit map of our 2040 transit vision. And we're looking basically at 10 corridors that we want frequent service to. 
of the definition of frequent transit is a bus that comes at least every 15 minutes, which we have a few of right now, but not nearly as many as we want. And, you know, as you can see, many of our goals are points of interest out in Henrico, Chesterfield, and Hanover counties from the airport, Short Pump, Westchester, uh, Mechanicsville, Ashland, et cetera. And so this is the vision um, geographically. And so if you guys look at all of the black lines, which are overwhelmingly centered in the city, those are all the GRTC local routes as they are today, regardless of frequency. So if it's a black line, it could have 15 minute service or hourly service or even less. And so the green lines are where we want that extended. And so you can see um, just as you go out from the core, how service really drops off completely. And so that's what we're pushing for. But if you look at short pump, which is kind of in the top left a little bit, um, you can see uh, the 19 having gone all the way past short pump a little bit. And so that's the type of thing that we're looking for. It's not at the frequency what we want, but the access is now there, which we are really happy for. But as we look at the next, uh, oh my gosh, as we look at the next slide, we have a lot of progress to make. So the good colors on this map, and these are just our 2040 vision corridors, are the green and the turquoise. So that would be the one, the two, the three, no longer the five, that got cut in frequency and the pulse. So our goal is 15 minute service and then BRT or enhanced bus service is just the cherry on top. But as you see, as you get away from the text Richmond where downtown is, service very quickly plummets. So um, yellow would be 30 minute frequency, orange would be 60, and then red, which there's a lot of, there's no service at all. So like, let's say you, you live in the city, you're trying to, you know, get a job, better your life, um, and you get a job offer out at Chesterfield Town Center. You cannot get there. And so then you get caught in this catch 22 of not being able to have access to employment. Um, and then also not having the means to get out there. And so we're really trying to highlight that, especially as so much of our retail um, and um, other commercial areas have moved outside of the city. Um, Diana? So to really focus in on the point of um, wanting to have a good regional transit system, as well as acknowledging that there are people who live outside the densest part of the cities, we found the information available online and put it on a layer in ArcGIS or QGIS to show um, the current GRTC local routes, which are in the white and the black lines, and then population density from less dense to more dense, which you can see in the reddish pink areas. So we can see along the main corridor in Richmond and say the fan downtown Chuckle Bottom are pretty dense and we have good bus coverage there. But if you look at the pockets in the suburbs outside of the city, you can see that it's really dense in um, the south and in the west. There is a population of people who live outside the city who do, do live in poverty, <clears throat> but we want to focus on density in this, in this one specifically, part of you'll talk about later. It should be a really considered regional system to make sure that all people in different areas have access to transit, regardless of which parts of the area they live in. Um, so as we can see, there are people who live outside the city who also need transit as much as those who live inside the city. After you. And so um, as far as transit expansion, um, we are in a quite the pickle in that there's a, been a massive bus operator shortage. Um, this is part of the national labor shortage. Um, and this is not a problem unique to Richmond. As far as I understand, every single transit agency in North America has this problem. Um, if you look at the green bar, we're right now at about 246 um, full-time operators. And so we're about 10% short. And so GRTC has had to cut service. And there has been just, it's been very hard on the operators having to work, um, having to work understaffed. And part of that problem was that before wages were some of the lowest in the region as far as people who had a CDL. Um, it was about 1740 an hour for the starting wage. There was a bonus, but if you can see the different public school systems, VCUs, um, circulator bus, 
and then especially like Greyhound and then the trucking industry, they paid a lot more. And thankfully on April 9th, and this is what I was talking about when things were happening as we were updating the report, the GRTC board unanimously passed a massive wage increase going from 1740 starting to about 2490. And so I do know um, one of the administrators there spoke up and said already one person who had quit asked if he could come back, presumably based on pay. And so we're hoping that GRTC is actually sitting on money to expand based on this new uh, tax um, that is going into this Central Virginia Transportation Authority that they have not been able to expend to expand. And so we're hoping that this wage, you know, this is a multifaceted problem. There are issues with safety, with scheduling, and lots of things. But we're hoping that at least the wages go from the bottom to almost the top. And if you consider people who want to spend every night at home, it is at the top. So kudos to the board. It's a really important step towards not only restoring service that's currently cut on the 5 and the 20 and a few other buses, but expanding service because there are plans to make more bus routes 10 minutes um, and then also expand coverage as well. So it's going to take a few months as more people respond to the higher wages, get through training, and then get acclimated to the system. But we're really optimistic that we will start to see a lot of positive developments through this. And so moving on, we can look at the um, kind of transit and jobs. And so as you can see, the lines are the, the dark blue black lines. Those are the current routes. You can see our vision routes on top of that that are color coded. And then the, the meat of this map is kind of the splotchy heat map. And so white, transparent, there's no jobs really. As you get into orange and then yellow, there's more jobs. And then blue is like a job hub. And so in some ways, things look good. You can see why, one of the reasons why the pulse was put where it was, because it's going through our densest section of jobs up and down the Broad Street corridor. But also, if you look out Midlothian, which is the line going straight left, where Johnston Willis Hospital and Chesterfield Town Center are, there is no service there. And that's kind of what I was talking about. Thankfully, Chesterfield is looking into expanding service down that corridor, for example. But that's also contingent on the labor shortage because there is not um, enough drivers to drive the routes we currently have, much less expansion. Um, and so, you know, then there's other jobs in Hanover, like Memorial Regional, uh, Virginia Center Commons, uh, the Government Center of Chesterfield, um, even the future Lego factory, which I'm sure, you know, there's a huge buzz about that in the bottom right. Um, there is absolutely no plan for people to get there if they don't have a car. And, you know, that's just a huge chunk of your income going towards something that we believe that not everybody should be forced to pay for. So for our second pillar, um, dignified places to wait, um, we're going to talk more about that plan about GRTC. Um, they're trying to massively increase um, the amount of bus benches and shelters at bus stops. And then also part of the reason why it's so difficult and also um, why it's uniquely difficult in Virginia. We've learned not only is it difficult in Virginia, but we are special and not in the good way. Like we are not it can take a long time to get a bus shelter installed and for reasons that feel really not thought through. Um, and so I do want to mention Earl's um, comments. Um, so um, this is the Walmart on uh, Brook Road. He said there's no shelter and there's no bench. There used to be a bench there. They took it out and people are actually bringing their cart from Walmart to sit on it. That doesn't look good. So a little more shelter and benches would be good. I think that's very reasonable. We don't know the backstory of why the bench was removed, but you know, it's affecting real people. And like, you know, I'm sure you guys have seen the turned over shopping carts at bus stops. People want it, but there's just a lot. It can be more difficult than it needs to be to get the stuff installed. Um, and so Diane is gonna talk a little bit about the GRTC plan itself and what it means for us. So GRTC has created the Essential Transit Infrastructure Plan, the ETI plan, um, and it addresses those problems that we see with lack of bus benches and bus shelters. So currently only 26% of GRTC bus stops have a, a bench or shelter out of over 1,600. 
And they have a five-year plan up until 2027 to have at least 50 to 75% of bus stops have a shelter or seating. And this is all contingent on funding. So there are two different funding goals I wanted to list in this graph. Um, specifically for benches, it differentiates between attainable and aspirational goals. So attainable is, this is a funding they have right now. And based on this funding that we have, this is how many buses we can install by 2023, 2024, 2025, 26, 27, incrementally. But with the aspirational goal, the bus benches, they grow exponentially over the course of several years. So we can see the difference from attainable to aspirational going from a little above 500 to almost 1,000 benches based on this aspirational goal. Uh, for shelters, however, regardless of the attainable money or the aspirational goal money, it'll be the same amount of shelters. But the emphasis we do want to have is that benches, having a dignified places to sit and wait for the bus um, is very important. And in order to address those things, GRTC does need to have more funding. Aspirational is over $28 million compared to the existing $11 million. And so the hope of this is to give that push and to advocate for that funding to make sure that we can have over 1,000 benches for all of the bus stops. The way they make the distinguishment between which bus stops get the benches and the shelters is by assigning each stop with an equity score and a ridership score. So they took all the bus stops, they had a survey, and they uh, graded them um, equity-wise by looking at the factors contingent in the area. So it showed the demographic of the area. Um, are they people of color? Is there a lack of jobs in the area? Is there higher education, lower education, access to jobs? And then the ridership score, which is how many people used the bus at this stop. They aggregated the information and they did some formula magic. And based on that, every single bus has a score. And then as you can see, the new bus stop that they created in Churchill, they incrementally take the bus stops that have these scores and then apply the funding to them. And so that is a long-winded way of saying there's a goal, it's a plan, we just need more money. Yeah. Oh, and like well, like I mentioned in the in the transit news, you know, this is happening. You know, um, they had to, if you see progress slowing down before things got started, it's because they were putting a lot of these infrastructure um and logistical things in place. So hopefully, fingers crossed, and in part you know, with our advocacy that they can keep hold fast to this goal of really transforming the amount, the quality of the bus shelters across the system. Um, and now the bad news about bus shelters. Um, so installing bus shelters is a convoluted mess. And I don't mean that lightly. It can take over two and a half years. Uh, this is a statewide problem. Um, it takes a huge amount of different stakeholders and even just different governmental agencies at the state level uh, talking to each other and getting stuck in each other's bureaucratic processes. So the core of the problem is that a lot of our main roads in Richmond and across the state are maintained by the Virginia Department of Transportation, VDOT. Somehow along the way, there's something in our Virginia code that says that bus shelters have to be uh, beholden to the same rules as housing. And then it gets caught in this whole mess of where uh, VDOT has to get another state agency that I hadn't really heard of before this investigation called the Department of General Services to approve the um, structure of the actual bus shelter itself and evaluate it like it's a house. And that can take months. DGS also charges the respective agency for their time at a huge amount of money per hour. And let's say you have a new bus shelter like the one we saw earlier um, in the news. If you get that approved, that approval only stays active for one year. Um, even if you get the exact same shelter next year, it always expires June 30th. And it has to be, even if it's the exact same shelter. Now, if you add like a solar light to that shelter, it's now a different model and it has to go through this absolute crazy process all over again. And that's just phase one of a four phase process. Um, you have to get land use permits and it bounces between different offices of the Virginia Department of Transportation. Um, 
And part of the problem is that a lot of rural transit agencies that don't have the resources that a GRTC would have or a Hampton Roads Transit are basically being told by their local VDOT office that, that they are de facto barred from it because the process is too expensive and too long. So now we're finding out um, through the point man at DRPT that VDOT never knew about the problem because people would submit so few bus shelter applications that they never understood that it was a problem because people were basically self-policing themselves of saying this isn't worth it. And you got to realize that VDOT maintains every road in Chesterfield. It maintains like Broad Street, Melosian Turnpike, um, 360 Hall Street, um, Route 1, Chamberlain, Richmond Highway. So you can see these are a lot of the places where we want there to be more service and correspondingly good bus stop infrastructure. Um, thankfully, DRPT has made this a huge focus of theirs. The director um, has made it a priority of the organization, and they are also partnering um, to think of ways with the transit agencies, both inside policy changes and outside of policy changes. But this is unique to Virginia. It is a huge problem, and thankfully, this year, there's starting to be real progress being made, at least on the education and the awareness. A lot of the problem was ignorance. People just didn't realize this was a problem. And, and until maybe three months ago, there was never a written um, outline of what you needed to do. And then also these agencies would call VDOT and they wouldn't know what to do either. So just the process to install a bus shelter in this state. It's bad. And that is part of the thing we want to fight. If we want dignified places to wait, we need to get rid of this bureaucracy, make it make sense that there are still lots of code that will keep this structure structurally safe and still it not being necessarily going through the same process as a house, which is honestly ridiculous. Um, we are still learning more by the day. I think DRPT, DRPT is a Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transportation. They are another state agency. So I'm sorry for not mentioning that earlier. Bills, they are still learning things about this as well. So hopefully for the upcoming General Assembly, maybe there can be some sort of legislation introduced that would help alleviate this problem. Um, and so that wraps up Dignified Places to Wait. So we're going to move on to Elevating Writers' Voices. Under here is one of our marquee um, campaigns to maintain zero fare indefinitely. Austin mentioned a bit, bit about the bus rider demographics and also transit access and how that correlates to property. Um, so I will read Alyssa's comment, which I really appreciated, um, about zero fare. Um, so free fare has affected me tremendously. Right now, I'm staying in a shelter, and I don't have money to be paying for bus fare. So it's good that they have the free fare because they're making it easier for me. I wouldn't be able to get to work if it wasn't for the free fare. Um, and so that is what we're looking for, that we do. We never want transportation to be a barrier to somebody having a happy and prosperous life. Um, and so speaking of zero fare, we believe that it's a vital policy that needs permanent funding. If anybody doesn't know, it just means that anybody and everybody can get on and off the bus for free. Um, it's equitable, as I mentioned earlier, you know, everybody deserves access to transportation without any sort of impediments or barriers. It's also efficient. The buses run quicker when fares don't have to be collected because everybody just gets on the bus. You don't have to wait somebody fumbling for change or there'd be a big backup, but you can have all door boarding that people can get on the bus both at the front and rear door, and the buses actually speed up, which we're really happy about. And it's also financially sustainable um, and uh, for climate as well, because zero fare increases ridership. If the price of something goes down, more people are going to use it, especially if it's free. And then the state of Virginia allocates a big chunk of money to every agency, and part of that funding formula comes down to how many people are riding the bus we are zero fare. So more people are riding the bus relatively. So we actually are getting some of that money back for each person that rides the bus because the bus was free. And if more people are riding the bus, that is less carbon being polluted into our climate. And so Diana is going to talk a little bit about the uh, bus rider demographics. 
So every couple of years, JRTC um, does a bus demographic survey. They have volunteers uh, ride JRTC bus stops and buses, and they ask everybody uh, questions about what's your race, age, gender, education, employment, income, trip purpose. So the composite JRTC bus rider is a transit dependent woman of color making under 25K a year. We really wanted to emphasize that the majority of our bus riders are African-American and women. Um, half of all of bus riders are full-time employees. 50% and more of bus riders make below 25K a year. And trip purpose, more than half of the time, it is to go to work. So the people who ride the bus are typically those who need it the most. Um, women tend to have more homekeeping type of caretaker jobs that require bus um, ridership more. And people who ride the bus are going to their jobs half the time, and that's where they go to work, but they do make under 25K a year, um, which really shows how important zero fare is for people in the community to make sure that part of their income doesn't go towards how they get to work. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about the poverty map? Mm -hmm. um, so this is another map where we got the information um, online then added it to a map on QGIS. And yet, again, you can see that the black and white line has the local uh, GRTC routes. And then you see from green to red, um, less poverty and then more poverty. So we can see that the Central part of the city ish, where it's mainly uh, red and orange. Uh, that's where uh, Chaco Bottom is, Chaco Slip is, and there's really good access to transit there. But as you can see along Route 1, Hall Street, and Midlothian Corridor, there are more concentrations of poverty outside of the city. Uh, this blends into the need of a regional transit system, as well as it shows the suburbanization of poverty. When it becomes too expensive to live in the city, you move outside of the city. But if you don't have the money to pay for a car and you rely on the bus that only comes once every 30 minutes, every hour, or it doesn't even go to where you live at all, that greatly limits the accessibility that you have to a life outside of where you live, where you can get to work, if you have to walk to work, if you can't drive, the bus doesn't come there. So although we may see a map of Chesterfield, Henrico, and think, why should people need to go out there, come here. There are a wealth of jobs within the city and along the corridors that those who live outside the city will need to go to and vice versa. So those pockets around Kimberly Acres, Hull Street and Tuckahoe show that there are places in the census gaps outside the city that don't even have access to transit at all. So not only is there limited transit within the area, but there are places that it doesn't even go to. So those are some areas addressed by the 2040 uh, transit plan, but also areas that aren't. So this is just, again, a way to emphasize that having a regional transit system that is frequent and far reaching benefits not only those who live in the cities, but those who live outside the cities where a majority of poverty stricken people tend to live. Awesome. Cool. So as far as policy asks, we're going to kind of divide these up into the three pillars we just talked about. So more buses, more places. The, the first and foremost thing is like, we got to end the bus operator shortage. And so we're so happy that, you know, the wages had a transformational increase, but I do know that's not the only thing about the job. If you don't feel safe, um, if the scheduling is really poor, um, if you can't really plan your life around transit and make sure, or plan around about operating bus. Um, it's a multifaceted problem, but it's not just a money thing. We are thankful that the GRTC board unanimously took that great first step to increasing wages. Um, you got to start somewhere. And so in part of that, we want to have service restored to pre-pandemic levels. Um, rider or bus routes have still been cut um, relative to service before the pandemic. Uh, we want to see Chesterfield ex execute their planned extension out Midlothian Turnpike to the Walmart way out on Walmart way. And then um, there was an increase in funding in 2020 um, that I may have mentioned, the Central Virginia Transportation Authority. Our sales tax has increased. Um, our, um, we have a gas tax and a diesel tax now. So, you know, GRDC is in a strange position of they're sitting on money to expand the system that they can't spend because they don't have the operators to drive it. So everything kind of centers around this bus operator shortage right now. 
As far as dignified places to wait, I think you guys heard me loud and clear that we need to streamline the process to get bus shelters installed. Um, and there is a one thing I will mention: this that crazy process does not um, behold into benches or trash cans. So there are ways that these localities can still improve bus infrastructure um, without getting caught in this process in the meantime. And to execute fully and on time GRTC's essential infrastructure plan, ideally the attainable version where we would have almost one out of every two stops would have a bench and then another 25% would have a shelter. Um, and then elevating riders buses, you know, our transit ambassadors hear time and time again that, you know, zero fare is an important and transformational policy for people. Um, we have a lot of audiograms on our social media if you want to hear some of the stories of different bus riders. Um, they'll look at the same format as the one we heard earlier. And we want to increase bus riders input for decision making. Um, GRDC used to have a group called the Transit Advisory Group. And that was a group of 10 people who would meet with the executive leadership of GRDC and, and offer direct feedback over what was going well and what wasn't. That has been suspended. So we are working with GRDC to get that relaunched in the fall so that they can have direct bus rider feedback. In addition to us being a conduit, bringing comments and stories to different elected um, and board officials who are often the ones making decisions at the end of the day. And then we can look at funding generally. Um, this is, I think, one of the most surprising data points. Um, oh, Diana, this is your slide. Do you want to take it? I would love to. Please, this go for it. A very fun information to dig around at online. So this is a Metro Transit funding. This is by Metropolitan Statistical Area, uh, not cities. So Richmond's MSA is Richmond, Henrico, Chesterfield, and the same goes for all of these cities that's for their metropolitan region so i use the national transit database to look at their each msa has their own list of transit companies within them richmond is lucky we only have grtc other msas have multiple they can have two or five or ten and all of them have their listed operational costs every single year for each transit company so for each MSA, I found all of their transit companies, added up all their operational costs, and then divided that by their populations. And these are all MSAs of really similar population size to Richmond. So although this looks like a very different graph, we have similar-ish population sizes, just up, a bit below and a bit below above. So Richmond is second to last in terms of uh, spending per capita on transit per person, Salt Lake City blows us out of the water exponentially, which was very surprising to learn. Oklahoma City, we're a bit better than them, so good for us. But as you can see, Memphis, Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, Louisville, New Orleans, Milwaukee, Hartford, we're not doing so great in terms of places that have very similar population sizes to us. We are a compact area. Our region is not that big geographically, we have the ability to spend more per person to invest. We're not doing so great right now. So if there's a way for us to go from second place to gosh, as high as we possibly can in terms of uh, funding per person, that's one of the goals we aim to have. GRTC has this money, please let's put it somewhere. Let's invest it in each person. Cool. Awesome. So I think that about wraps things up. Um, Diana, if you don't mind, uh, could you drop a link to the full report in case people want to look at it? Um, but now I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, Stephanie, are you able to help facilitate the way my Zoom is set up? I can't really see um, the chat or I Faith can, as well. Yeah, I can help you with that. Okay. Um, I don't have any questions, so please um, you guys start dropping your questions in the chat. You can do hashtag Q. Um, but while we're waiting on some questions, Diana, you said that this was one of the things that really stuck out to you as far as how much we're spending per capita. Was there anything else in this report that you guys thought, wow, um, I didn't know that about our city? I would have to say definitely the demographics was the one that really impacted me the most. Um, 
whenever I think about uh, wage and gender and race and jobs, the average retail or fast food worker is a 35 year old woman of color, usually with children. So that data is pretty representative in transit riders too. Um, people who use the buses the most tend to be the ones who have those jobs within bus like stop areas. Um, so seeing that reflected in demographics versus what we know already from sociology or from urban studies is that exact like example of this is why transit is important because it impacts all of these people's lives making them better helps everyone in the community we need to uplift those people the most to make everyone have benefits from that so i found that the most interesting to me yeah richard um any feedback or thoughts on that what stuck out to you while we're waiting on more questions yeah i think um the data we the findings we researched from the bus operator shortage of uh, um, finding out that for comparable jobs with CDLs, GRGC was paying the lowest. And so we, you know, so many people are wondering, well, why is there an operator shortage? And, you know, if you could go make a significant amount more money, you know, working somewhere else, you can't really blame people for doing what's in their best interest. So I really applaud GRTC for recognize that and addressing that. And also I remember it was a big deal when GRTC, you can now get your CDL in-house at GRTC. And yeah. I thought that was an advantage. And now I'm fine. And then through that research, it was like, oh, they went from below par to par. You know, they're competitive, but it's not like they were providing a unique CDL training that other places that needed a CDL weren't. So that was a really cool kind of investigative process of piecing together at least one part of why the, the, the bus operators just were consistently short for a couple of years now. Yeah, I think one thing to, um, to piggyback off Diana is, you know, when zero fare is happening, we're realizing that um, the challenge of folks who are working full-time positions and they're still making under 25,000 is, is really, really insane um, that we uh, nationally, our rent has increased, our food has increased, and we still have employment opportunities where people are working full-time and they're making 25 grand. It's impossible to live in our city. And our city is basically designed to keep people at that rate um, because folks are not getting access or having access to higher paying jobs. And that's the key here, um, to move people from this income to uh, to more opportunity and better trans public transportation can do that for folks. So we have a few questions. Let's dive right into it. This one comes from Megan. Um, how do y'all think we can increase ridership even more to bring in those who currently have bias against using the bus? Um, one thing I have to say is, you know, raising awareness that the bus is free. A lot of my friends, even around town who don't take transit, have no idea the bus is free. And then I'm like, you should try it. And they're like, yeah, and, then, and I'm like, it's free. You literally have nothing to lose. They perk up. Um, so that I definitely think could be a marketing thing. Um, and then also, you know, I think there needs, there's a lot of, um, ghost buses, buses that are scheduled that don't come. And a lot of issues with reliability right now, mostly due to the operator shortage. And so I think, you know, we need to make sure that when, you know, we obviously don't want service cut, but we also don't want GRTC to promise a level of service that they can't physically run. So I think you got to build and maintain trust in the transit system. Any thoughts on that, Diana, as how we can um, combat bias? about using the bus. I think that's a huge itch, issue right now because the narrative of even expanding into the county lines, there was a narrative of with more buses brings crime. Um, and so how do we change that narrative? And you may not need to answer that, Diana, but along those lines. Um, I, I wanna say just normalizing bus usage for anything. At the Mobility University talk we gave before, um, last week, that was sort of mentioned, the bus, the bus brings this bias or bus stops have this bias. If we normalize it, break the stereotype that anybody can ride the bus, regardless of what demographic you fall into, it serves everybody equally. 
um, students especially, we can ride the bus, not just uh, to go to work or class. We can go visit our friends because of it. We can go, go to shops, go to get food. Um, it's not just for what people have the idea of what a typical bus rider is. I think that's a very um, harmful stereotype to have or to have this idea of what, what you would expect to see on a bus. I think just in general, buses are good. We should tell everybody that because then we get more riders and then we get better funding, then we have better buses. It's a whole positive feedback loop. Um, that's my answer. Yeah, and I think too, when we really show the demographics of who's riding the bus and what for, 51% of people who are using public transportation are using it to get to work. So you don't ride the bus in our city because you want to, it's more you have to, you have no other option. And the reason why you're using it is for an essential um, thing you have to do in your life is get to work. Um, and I think that narrative needs to change that people will use public transportation for getting to work. And also too, as we look at other cities like New York or even DC, people, anyone uses the bus. And I think our, our culture within the city, we have to shift that and to say, again, like you said, Diana, anyone can use the bus. All right, so let's move on to another question. Um, how can I get involved? I'm a daily writer that is interested in being an ambassador. Great question. Uh, the so ambassador that. part will be faith. Okay. <laughs> a couple of things that you can do if you're a daily writer. Um, this will be, there'll be a slide at the very end of this presentation or at the end of the um, transit talk. But one, you can adopt a bus stop. If you're writing every day, you're already going to your bus stop. Um, that There's a uh, adopt a stop program that I run where you keep the bus stop clean every month. Um, and then you could also submit a comment to the writer's voice. Um, and we'll have the phone number listed in just a second, but you can actually call and leave a voicemail of your comments. Um, if you would like to share your story about that, particularly maybe about Zero Fare, how that's impacted you or about regional transit or about the operator shortage. I mean, those are some of the biggest topics of, of what we're dealing with right now. Um, that's what I have. Faith, do you have any additions? Yeah, so right now we, um we don't have any open positions for ambassadors, but we want more ambassadors. We realize that this opportunity is huge. Um, so we will have some opportunities for you to volunteer um, to, to do some of this work. So what you can do is you can email info at rvarapidtransit.org um, and we can have conversation about how you can volunteer with us. Um, but as Richard mentioned, please look into the things that we currently have. So being a doctor is great, um, but also any volunteer work. And so we, at the end of the slide, we have more opportunities for you to get involved and we'll share that. Um, here's a question from Jane. Are there any other goals outside of the three main pillars that RV Rapid Transit is hoping to push for? One of the main things that comes to mind is pedestrian corridors where certain streets would have private tr um, traffic roads exclusively um, banned for those roads um, for pedestrians and cyclists in transit. So this is a good point because we recently had um, a community partner of ours pass away, um, Sean, um, at the result of this, this main issue. Now what RV Rapid Transit has done is partner with uh, or other organizations like Bike Walk RVA, who have this in their essential infrastructure and their mission plan. So although we don't have these specifically named in our report, we do support it. So thank you so much for mentioning that. And so what we have done as an organization is partner with other organizations who have this because we do realize that biking, walking and cycling definitely intersects with using public transportation. Um, you cannot use the bus and not walk there. Uh, and the majority, a lot of people are bike cycling in addition to catching the bus. So we are definitely, um, definitely partnering with other organizations who have this a part of their mission. So thank you so much for mentioning that. Um, along the same lines as Jane's, RVA Bike Share was just shut down overnight. 
Is there an intersection between this work and building a thriving bike share system? So no, not in particular. I think, again, we are definitely partnering with Bike Walk RVA, um, who is supporting this, this type of infrastructure, but we don't specifically have um, any campaigns for bike. And I'm so sorry. I'm sad to hear that this bike share just shut down overnight because these are, again, essential um, infrastructure for people to choose to travel. Because again, not every bus goes every direction. So um, opportunities to use a bicycle really breaks down that travel time and um, you getting to point A to point B. So that's why a lot of people use bikes. So we, we're definitely behind that this be included. Um, any comments about what I just read, you guys, about those questions? Diana and Richard? I do agree that when you look at a thriving transit system, uh, biking, walking, and transit accessibility are all really important parts of a healthy corridor or um, any way to get around. That's why I like the work that we do here as the transit um, nonprofit arm working in like tandem with Bike Walk RVA also. Uh, it's having this comprehensive, cohesive coalition amongst all the alternative modes of transportation in the area uh, helps us know that we are not alone in this mission, but it is important to also take these things into consideration when talking about transit. Uh, there's this concept, first mile, last mile, when it comes to a bus stop location is there is a really good bus system that takes you from near where your job is to near where your home is, but it takes you a five, seven minute walk to get there. If you don't have a good sidewalk or you have mobility issues to get you there, or there isn't even a path to go, how do you get to that really good transit system? So biking and walking are ways to fill in that gap. So they do work with transit. We have those other partners we work with. That's really good for us. All right, well, thank you so much, you guys, for your questions. What I wanna do now is shift and just go into our closing remarks. Um, this was a really great conversation. Thank you so much for the great questions. And I see there's a lot of comments in the chat. Thank you for giving those. Um, and give it up quietly for Richard and Diana. If you are able to do some hand claps or put some hand claps, cut on your, um, audio or I'm sorry, don't cut on your audio, cut on your video <laughs> and give them a little hand clap. Um, that was great work. Thank you guys. So I wanted to invite you some to some events that we're having coming up. Um, I briefly mentioned that we have Mobility University, which is a five week training course. Um, and so this five week training course, um, excuse me guys. Let's see, this five week training course, um, this is an opportunity for the young lady who mentioned like, how can I get involved? How can I be a part of this? Join Mobility University. And so um, we're wrapping up this session, this spring session. We talk about um, how to build a campaign. Uh, we talk about walkability and active transportation. Um, we also talk about transit governance, how we break down the funding of transportation. We do power mapping. So who makes those transit decisions in our area, how to reach them. We also talk about storytelling and then um, how to write a public comment and a host of other things. So this takes place over five weeks. Um, we just wrapped up our last session of training. And so this next Wednesday, on May 31st, we have our graduation and reception. We want you to come. We want you to celebrate um, these graduates who um, took their time and their energy to learn about how to self-advocate on their own behalf. Um, and so although we did a spring um, session, we're gonna do a fall session that will start September 6th. So you can go ahead. I don't think we have our applications out yet, but be a part of this, um, come to the graduation and then also join our newsletter so that you can get when that fall session opens up. But five, Wednesday, May 31st, 5.30 to 7 p.m. Um, I think someone is gonna drop the registration links so you can come join us. But we all have commencement speaker, the Honorable Ellen Robinson. She's a Richmond City Council member, as well as a GRTC board uh, member who's gonna be doing our commencement speech. So please join us for that. We'll love to have you. 
And then um, to celebrate this, the hard work um, that Richard and Diana put into place, but also have a deeper conversation. We will not be having a um, transit talk in the month of June. We're going to do um, a reception. So on June 13th, um, we're, and we're going to invite you to Common House, where you can take a deeper dive in this report. Um, we want to immerse you into this report where you can have drinks, cocktails, but also have a conversation amongst um, peers like yourself about all of the topics that we just discussed today. And so that'll take place again, um, June 13th, um, 2023 from 6 to 8 p.m. Please register for this event um, by June 3rd, okay? So we will love to see you there. I believe they put an invite in that so we can have a deeper conversation about everything we just talked about. Um, and then last but not least, um, take action. We want you to take action. So some of the ways that you can start to take action, um, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, what some of the other ways that you can start to take action is ride the bus. Um, we had a writer mention that they're a current writer, but more transportation funding comes to our region when you ride the bus. So the first step you can take is just um, choose one or two trips throughout the week that you choose by bus. And then also we have an adopt a stop program where you can choose a bus stop within your area or a list of needed bus shelters to clean them. There's uh, some, not a lot of funding dedicated to keep stops and shelters clean. So we're encouraging citizens to participate until that dedicated funding is there. And then also share your story. We'll love to hear feedback and short stories um, about what your experience is. You can call 804-286-0007 and leave your comment. We'll love to share that with um, the general public, but also with GRTC board directly. And then also donate. Your donations support the work that we do here at RVA Rapid Transit. So please support the work that we do. All right. So thank you again so much for joining Transit Talk. Um, we will see you next month at um, the State of Transit Report. Thank you so much. Have a good day.